This morning we're going to turn to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 16 to 18. 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 16 to 18. The Lord laid this message on my heart. I was sharing with Pastor Torrance Nash some things that were laid on my heart. And, and I said, you know, I said, Pastor, there's got to be more. <laughs> there's got to be more in this life that God wants us to experience. There's, there's got to be more. Like, I, I'm okay. I, I love the Lord. And I, I like where I'm at. But God, there's got there's to be more. There's got to be more. God wants to, is us to experience more joy, more peace, more deliverance, more freedom, more seeing our family members saved, more seeing the Spirit of God operate in this place, not just in this place, but into our homes and into our families' homes. God wants to move. And I said, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. And the, word, the Lord spoke this to my heart. Angela, dig ditches in the valley. Amen. Dig ditches in the valley. And it's explained in 2 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 16. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, You shall not see wind, Neither shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink both you and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing. Say light thing. Light thing. This is but a light thing <laughs> in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, in this book, it was written by the prophet Jeremiah. And if you know anything about the prophet Jeremiah, he, he faced some pretty hard and difficult times with the people of God and, and pointing them in the way of righteousness. He was known as the weeping prophet. And in prayer this morning, a couple of us were sharing some experiences just in ministry and just in ministering to family members and to friends. And sometimes when you want something for someone so bad and, and you want to and you're pouring into them and then it's not happening, you know, the way that you think it should happen. There's a, there's a breaking of the heart that happens. There's a weeping in the heart that happens. And you know what? That's the heart of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had the heart of God for the people. And the people were not receiving the word of God. So we seen him crying. But we also seen strength and courage. And we seen his name means Yahweh. I thought this was cool. I didn't know this one. Yahweh will raise. Yahweh will raise. So I want to encourage you this morning. That if you're going through something this morning that you feel like, I just can't get my head above water, well, Yahweh will raise. <laughs> he will raise you up this morning. If you can receive what he has for you this morning, he will pick you up this morning. He is the God of the resurrection. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the circumstances during the writing of this book was Solomon. It was from Solomon to Babylon exile. And it was the kings of Israel and Judah. So the nation was divided, Judah and Israel, and they found themselves in disunity. And I want to say this this morning, that a house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. And we were talking about in prayer this morning, I believe I was talking to Naya about it. That this time more than ever is a time that we need to stand together as a body of Christ and believe together and link arms together. I know I say that a lot, but I feel like we hear it and then we walk out the doors and every, we all go into our own lives. And that's fine. We, we need to do what we need to do in life. But remember your brother or sister in prayer. You know, the best thing that we can do for one another is pray for one another. The best thing we can do for one another is stand in the gap for one another and intercede and believe for one another. But at this time, this nation
nation was in decline because they were disunified, because they were in disunity. So think about that. Is if us as a body of Christ are, are in disunity, there's going to be a decline. There's going to be a decline, and I believe that God has brought us together to believe him for great things and to believe him for more. But the main purpose of this book was to fulfill God's covenant to his people. God fulfilled his covenant when he sent Jesus to die on the cross and he gave you access. He already fulfilled it. But I believe there is a constant fulfillment that he wants to reveal in our lives every day. There's a fulfillment that he wants us to receive each and every day to what he has already done and given us access to. So I want to encourage you this morning, dig deep in the faith. Dig deep in the faith. If you found yourself in a valley this morning, and if you're not in a valley this morning, you surely will be one day. So I want to encourage you and pray that this gets in your spirit. Dig deep in faith in the valley. And what does that mean? Stand upon the word of God. What God has spoken to you, what his word says, you can rest assured that he is going to fulfill his promise in your life. See, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but it gets me excited because he said, you're not going to see the wind, you're not going to see the rain coming, but it's coming. If we can stand and hang on to the promise that God has made us, it is coming. Yes. Get ready. See, he was preparing the people in the valley to get ready for what he was about to do, because what he was about to do was going to be greater than we could have ever imagined or thought of. And see, I'm not here just to hype you up. I don't want to hype you up. I want you to know that this is the truth of the word of God. This is what God said. God said, dig ditches in your valley. Yes, yes. Dig See, don't just lay down in the valley. How many of us want to lay down when we get there? We are tired from the journey, and we just want to lay down and wallow in the valley. God, why am I here? Why am I going through this? Why did I face this as a child? Why did I face this from my friends? Why am I going through this in school, at my job? Da -da 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 -da. I might as well just lay here in the valley. Come on. And God said, no, get up and start believing. Get up and start digging. Get up and start accessing why I died for you. So in 2 Kings chapter 3, if you would put verses 1 through 3 up on the screen, I want to show you the circumstance, the situation, and the condition of the people. The circumstance, the situation, and the condition of the people of God that they found themselves in. So right now we're looking at it, and Jehoram reigns now over Israel. His father was Ahab, and Ahab dies. So actually go to verse 2 for me. It says, And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet, and made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. So all that wordage right there, what does that mean? That means that Jehoram is now the king of Israel after his father Ahab died. Ahab was the one that calls the children of God to worship Baal. So we see that he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord. What does that mean? That means that his faithfulness, his loyalty, his continued support and belief was to a false way and a false God and a false savior. And we can be like, well, we don't have no images up. We don't have, we don't have, I mean, Pastor Matt doesn't have this big image of Baal up in the church. And if he does, we're in trouble. <laughs> but I want to ask you this question. What as we, as children of God, look to to save us? 
doesn't have to be this image that we put up, this big image. Yeah. But what do you personally look to in the valley, in times of trouble? What do I look to in times of trouble to save me? Where does my loyalty and faithfulness lie? Because at this point, Jehoram's sin wasn't like his father's. I don't know about you, but, and I love my mother to death, and I love my dad. My dad passed away. But when I was growing up, because of the circumstance that I grew up in, I was always like, I don't ever want to be like this. I don't ever, I don't ever want to be like my mom or dad. I don't know. I love my mom now. My mom want to be just like my mom. Because <laughs> she is saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and running on with Jesus. And that's what I want to be like. And my dad got saved right before he passed away too. But before salvation, I didn't want to be like that. And I'm sure Jehoram had said, I don't want to be like my father who worshipped Baal. But I'm really not willing to go this way of the God of Israel. So instead, I'm going to put away Baal. I'm going to put him away as he is no more. But I'm going to still follow after a different God. And he, and he finds himself following after Je, um, Jeboram's God. So how many times have we gotten saved and we've got set free from things like big things? But we say, I'm still going to ride the fence. So I'm going to, thank God I don't do this no more. Thank God I don't do that no more. Thank God. You know all them big things that y'all can see. Thank God I don't worship these things anymore. I don't look to those things to save me. But, you know, I'm still going to, you know, ride the fence a little bit. I'm still not going to fully commit to the ways of God, to the things of God, to the mindset of God, to what God has for my life. I still want to dabble a little bit over here. So that's where they find themselves at, at this point. He cleaves, he clings to, he pursues the same sins as Jehoram, which was the golden calf, which this causes Israel to sin. This causes Israel to sin. And if you can put up on the screen that first picture... So I just wanted to show this up here. This is where it's divided from Israel to Judah. So right now I'm talking about Jehoram, who is the king of Israel right now. But all of a sudden the king of Moab, I believe Moab is on the screen as well. Yep, over there, the kingdom of Moab. He hears, because he had an alliance with the king of Israel when, when Ahab was the king. He had an alliance with him and he always went and paid tribute and would give gifts to the king. Well, when Ahab died, the king of Moab found it in himself that he was going to rise up and that he was not he was going to rebel against the king of Israel. See, when we decide that we're going to ride the fence for a little while, get ready because the enemy He's coming for you. Yeah. So then we find the king of Moab rebelling against the king of Israel, and he gets worried. He's like, uh oh, I need to go fight. What am I going to do? So he sends out for Jehoshaphat. Who, can I have that picture one more time? He sends out for Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah. Jehoshaphat is a godly king, though. He wants the things of God. He wants the ways of God. He follows after God. 2 Chronicles 17, 3 says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Because he walked. That word walked means he ordered his lifestyle in the first ways of his father David. And sought not Balaam. But sought the Lord, 
the God of his father and walked, ordered his life by his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So he had nothing to do with Israel. Therefore, because he walked, ordered his lifestyle after the Lord, the Lord established him and the kingdom in his hand. I want to tell you this. When you trust God, when you believe God, when you have faith in his word and in his ways, he will begin to establish you. He will begin to fix that which is in us that is wrong and that which is manifested outwardly that is wrong. He will begin to change things for us. That It also means to erect. He will cause you now when you once were burdened over with sin and condemnation and guilt and shame and pain and we're walking with our heads down. He will begin to establish you, meaning erect you and get you to stand upright in the confidence of your God. That's what caused Jehoshaphat to walk in the ways of God. And as he walked in the ways of God, God established him. Yes. And that's what we want to see operating in our everyday lives. But see, what I love about the Bible is it's so real. If you really dig deep into this thing, Jehoshaphat messed up plenty of times. So in 2 Chronicles, it says that the Lord was with him and that he established him in his kingdom. But what do you mean he messed up? Doesn't God only bless people that don't mess up? Doesn't God only move in people's lives that don't mess up? No. See, now the king of Israel comes knocking on the king of Judah's door and says, will you come with me? Because Moab has rebelled against me. And Jehoshaphat, without second thought, says this. He says, yes, I will go with you. I am as you are. My people as your people. And your horses as my horses. Wait a second. Jehoshaphat's people were not as Israel's people. Israel's people were worshiping false gods. Jehoshaphat was not as King Jerome. He wasn't. They were not the same. They were not in the same family. <laughs> they were not in the same connection. But now he goes with. See, mess up one. He didn't ask the Lord. Mm, yeah. He didn't even inquire of the Lord. He was a godly man teaching his people to worship Jehovah. And he didn't even say, um, this is a big deal. You're asking me to take my people into battle. How many times have we done that? How many times have we made decisions and just just wing it? <laughs> we just wing it. We're just like, oh, yeah, okay. We find ourselves in an alliance with something that is not of God. With a way that is not of God. With a people that is not of God. And, and then we're looking back like, where did we go wrong? Well, that word alliance means a union that is formed for mutual benefit. A connection, a bond of two parties, listen to this, that is an association to further your common interests. We should have no common interests with the ways of the world. Amen. There should be no common ground with the ways of the world and, and the ways, the wisdom of this world and the, and the spirit of this world. There is no common ground. There is no mutual bond. But he says, I will be as you are. I don't want to be like that. We shouldn't want to be like that. But you know what? Our flesh comes up. Yep. Yep. We get in the way. And all of a sudden, we start looking like the world. Well, he says, yes, I will go with you. Oh, I, this made me laugh because these words, yes, I will go with you. I am as you are. You are my people and your horse is my horse's. That was always used to expre express the closest form of an alliance. So when you were little, I was trying to think about what, what are ways that we used to like be in an alliance with somebody. Y'all remember the pinky promise? Yeah. yeah. Like you were like, yeah, we pinky promise this. We're taking this all the way home. <laughs> this is happening, right? Or what about, I 
remember my friend Jessica and I, we were, I don't know, we probably were like nine, but the blood brother, blood sister thing, and you would poke your finger, and then you would stick your fingers together, and you would be like, yeah, now we're, we're blood sisters for life, and, and we're in common union, and common ground. Well, okay, and what about, I swear on my grandmom's grave. I hear, I used to hear that all the time. I swear on my grandmama's grave. And, and that was meaning what I'm saying is truth. I'm in an alliance with that thing. This is true. Well, I want to tell you this. We are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are in common union. We are in common fellowship. We should have. Now, the blood of Jesus has now broken the domination of sin over our lives. So you don't have to be in union and mutual agreement with sin and the ways of this world any longer. That is now broken by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can pick he promise with Jesus that that's the truth. Amen. See, he already made blood brothers and sisters right here by, the, by Calvary. Hallelujah. So Jehoshaphat is considered a good godly king. But due to him continually wanting to make alliances with Israel, three times, not just once, three separate times in the word of God, we see Jehoshaphat make a wrong alliance. And you know what? It's really not that hard to do if you think about it in natural terms, if you think about it in our lives every day or the way that we might think. It's kind of easy to, at times, to make an alliance with old ways of thinking right. or like old ways of handling circumstances or situations or old, old um, wounds that come up and hurts and pains and all of a sudden we make an alliance with that pain. And now that, that pain or that unforgiveness or bitterness is now an alliance with us and now it's ruling and reigning in us. See, it's really not that hard, but the word of God says this, that due to the compromise of Jehoshaphat, listen to this, these wicked men, with the wicked men, that the hearts of the people were never fully changed. See, he was leading the people in the ways of God, but he was making alliances on the side. So if we are coming into the house of God and we want the things of God, and listen, I believe that we all do it here. And I believe that we're all born again and saved and, and filled with his spirit and he's leading us in the right way. But I want to tell you this and warn you of this and warn myself of this. But as we ever make alliances with things that are not of God, a common union, a common bond, our hearts will never change. They won't change in those areas because we're not giving the Holy Spirit free reign and leeway, legal right to be able to change those areas of our heart. Because we want to make an alliance with that thing. We still want to hold on to it. So yeah, we might have gotten rid of Baal, but we also need to get rid of the golden calf. <laughs> we also need to get rid of the littler things that we begin to make an alliance with or union with. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked. Together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what common um, communion has light with darkness? Amen. That word unequally yoked means joined together as a couple. Mm. I don't know about you, but if you fell in love with someone, you want to spend time with them, right? You want to be with them all the time. Well, the Bible says that that word unequally yoked means that you should not be joined together as a couple with unbelievers. Because when you are with someone, you begin to take on their traits and their mannerisms. Right. So you're going to begin to look like that person that right. you are yoked up with. Yeah. You're going to begin to look like that bitterness that you are yoked up with. Right. Right. We're gonna, going to begin to look like the people that we hang around and what they're involved in. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Does that mean don't share the gospel with unbelievers? No. Does that mean don't don't have dinner or you know? No. All right. Let's not live in lull. But it, let let's say let's not get yoked up. Make it as one with unbelievers. And it says, "What 
fellowship has righteousness with darkness. That word fellowship means that you're going to partake in and you're going to participate in as one with that agenda, that plan, or that way. So what fellowship, what participation do you, as a child of light, have to do with darkness? There should be no partaking in anything that has to do with darkness. Amen. Not an agenda, not a plan, and not a way. You should have no participation in it. Then it says, what communion has light, I'm sorry, light with darkness? That word communion means a shared association. Your buddies, your comrades, your amigos, your besties, okay? That, that word means that you, that light and darkness, are now buddies or companions. It's saying, no, <laughs> you should have no companion with darkness. So what happened? Time and time again we find in the end Jehoshaphat came down to nearly losing his life. And I just want to warn us as a people of God, if we continue in a direction where we yoke up with the wrong things, where we make alliances with the wrong things, where we where we are dabbling in darkness, where, where we're making um we're yoking up or having fellowship or partaking in things that aren't of God. It was to the point where he almost lost his life. Mm. And that's a warning, I believe, from the word of God. That if we walk too closely to the line of salvation. Or we ride the fence to the line of salvation. Then we are very close to losing our salvation. Losing our loved ones. Losing our family members. And I'm not saying it's easy to get there because obviously Jesus was, I mean, God was merciful to Jehoshaphat. I mean, it was three times. And he never did because he came close to. But I just want to encourage us not to even go there. That it's not even worth it. Because we're going to see that God later on makes a promise that as you stay in the valley, dig ditches in the valley and I will make you full. So now if you would go to the second picture... So now we see Jeho Jehoram and we see Jehoshaphat. Oh, wow. That is not it. <laughs> okay. We see them in union together, light and darkness. And now they're going to travel together. See, darkness can't dwell where light is. <laughs> and as they're traveling together, they're going to Edom. And they find themselves on a seven-day journey. And on the seventh day, they find themselves completely without water. Wow. Yep. Oh, come on. Yep. When we start making unions with things that are not of God, and we're like, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to make my own way. Um, you know, and sometimes we don't even really think about it. We're very flippant in our thinking. And we're just like, oh, well, I mean, this seems like a good idea. But we don't acknowledge the Lord in it because he can see what's around the corner. What was around their corner was a seven-day journey of no water. Well, I want to tell you this. There was no water. And what happens when there, no, there is no water? These are seven indications that you have not had enough water coming from a personal trainer. Okay. Your, your, your urine becomes dark. Okay, and I was just thinking about that. How many times have we gone in the wrong direction? Now there's no water and darkness begins to settle in on our lives. Two, there is brain shrinkage. You're not able to think right. There's confusion and chaos going on in your mind because you haven't been allowing the spirit of God to refresh you, to wash over you. Because now you're deciding, we're deciding to do our own thing. There is joint pain. So now you're not able to move easily and you're not even able to sleep. Right, right. Ooh, how many of us have the Lord got a hold of in the nighttime, in the midnight hour, where we know we ain't doing something we're supposed to be doing. And the Lord won't let you sleep. He will not let you go to sleep. No, ma'am. No, he won't. Until he gets a hold of your heart and we listen. Oh, man. And you know what? That happens time and time again, too. 
Then there is hunger. When we are hungry, there is a place where we can be hungry for other things because we don't allow the Spirit of God to fulfill the areas of our heart that He wants to. So we're on this journey. We're not on the path that God wants us to be on. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves hungry, but now hungry for other things. Then there's headaches. Oh, man. I thought about this. I thought about pain. the pain of memories of the things that we replay that we're holding on to or we have been facing. We have a headache. This one was interesting. Bloated. All of a sudden, you start to retain water and hold on to extra water. Has anybody ever done this before? We begin to hold on to old experiences with God but aren't experiencing new if we're retaining, we're bloated. We're still living off three years ago in that experience and move of God that we had, but, but we're not allowing and entering into the presence of God now and allowing him to refresh us. And then seven, slowly dying of thirst. It's a slow death to our relationship with God. And now here we go. We have King Jehoram. And he, this is the wicked king. And he says, he begins to blame God. Look what your God has done. Look what God has done. Wait a second. Isn't it interesting how as we, and I don't know if you have done this before you believed, but when we were unbelievers, we always blamed God. Right, right. God isn't real and I'm not going to choose to believe in him. <laughs> but when tough times come, it's God's fault. Right, right. Wait a second. I don't God. <laughs> right? But how many times do we do that too, even as children of God? All of a sudden we find ourselves in a tough spot and all of a sudden it's God's fault. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's God's fault that we got there. Well, he says God has brought us to this place, this rough place on our journey. And he begins to accuse them. But I love Jehoshaphat because he says this, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord? That we may inquire of the Lord by him. And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shabbat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. So the man of God gets a check in his spirit. And he's like, whoa. (laughs) I'm out here on this journey with this wicked other king. I have made an alliance with the wrong man. Because I don't have any water, and I am hungry, and I am thirsty, and I am feeling painful, and this is an agonized. So the Lord will allow us to back ourselves into a corner to get our attention that we would cry out to him. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happened. And all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat is like, wait a second. Wait. We need to touch heaven. We need to call on the name of Jesus. We need to call on the name of God. We need to get in the presence of God because something ain't right here. Something's wrong. Because my God brings favor. My God brings blessing. There should be water flowing if we were in the ways of God. There should be provision if we were in the ways of God. So in my eyes, as I see this, I see a heart of repentance. A heart that sees, oh, I messed up. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I need to turn back to the Lord because I found myself in far away from my land now into another land. And there has been no water for seven days. And now not only am I struggling, but my soldiers, my people are struggling and their cattle and their beasts are struggling. When we begin to go the wrong way, it affects the people around us. It affects our families. It affects our work life. It affects everything. So Jehoshaphat finds himself here and says, oh, I need to get back to the Lord. Something ain't right here. Something isn't right here. So he turns back and he doesn't, he doesn't wait any longer. He's like, now, right now, right now, I need to get in the presence of the Lord. And he says, I inquire of the Lord. Inquire means to properly tread. Belief in the cross is the path that we tread by faith. That one should frequently visit daily. Every single 
day. We should be frequently walking and treading the path of the cross. I'm believing you, Jesus. I'm trusting in the cross. I'm trusting in what you did at Calvary. I'm trusting in the victory that it's going to bring me. I'm trusting in the deliverance that it's going to bring me and my family. I'm trusting in the peace that you can only give me. Not as the world gives, but as only you can give. I'm trusting in the healing for the deep wounds in my heart and the deep wounds in my life. I'm trusting for deliverance. I'm trusting for freedom. I'm trusting for the baptism with the Holy Ghost. I'm trusting you. I'm walking this path. I'm believing it. I'm treading here. God, refresh me. I'm tired. I'm weak. I need you. I'm trusting you. I'm believing you. We should be frequently inquiring and treading the path of faith in the cross. And Pastor Larson said it this way one time. He said, it's like somebody walking on grass. And if you keep treading that same spot, well, I'll tell you a story. So our grass is messed up at home. We got four people in a driveway that only has three cars. Only allowed to have three cars, or supposedly allowed to have three cars. So we parked the other car on the other side. But you have to back up off the grass to get out. So every day, you see these tire marks in the grass where we go to get out because it's an everyday experience. <laughs> Somebody's got to leave every day. And that's what it should look like. It becomes clearer and clearer and clearer to us. The goodness of God, the grace of God, the things of God, as we keep treading that path of faith, as we keep believing him, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. So that's what he was saying. He said, inquire of the Lord. And he does, Elijah does, he says, because we were we were doing our thing. We were marching to the beat of our own drum. Mm. And we found ourselves in a dire situation. Right, right. God, make it clear. Jeez. And Elijah the prophet, now put this verse up because I was blown away, but this is good stuff. Second Kings 3.14 says, And Elijah said, As the Lord of the host lives, before him who I surely stand, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. So Elisha is talking to the king of Israel. He's talking to Jehoram, and he's saying, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even look at you. That was a deep statement. I was like, oh my gosh, Lord, that's like pretty harsh. But you know what? I see in Elijah, Elisha, as a type of the Holy Spirit, a type of one that was coming to help, that comes alongside to help. And he said, surely, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, this was something that was certain, that was, that was assured. Why Jehoshaphat? That word regard means Nassau, which means I accept him. See, you, the Holy Spirit can only work within someone who believes. Yeah, yeah. And it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that he can accept that person and work within the framework of that person. So he wasn't being mean, but he's saying you don't worship the one true God. You, you're not saved. You don't know God. So I can't regard you. I can't accept you. I can't even look at you because you're covered in sin. See, only the spirit of God can work within somebody that is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that is given their heart to him. Yeah. And you know what I love about this is, see, Jehoshaphat had messed up. But Elijah was still like, I still accept him. I still want to work in his life. I still want to give him favor. I still yeah. care for him. Yeah. So this is where they find themselves turning toward the man of God and showing a heart of repentance. See, repentance is not deliverance. So when we repent from the direction that we're going and we turn towards the ways of God, now we need to start treading that path. So you can't just stay back here and just turn. 
Now we got to start ordering our life and treading that path so that the Holy Spirit can move right, within right. that. He said, I cannot look at you. I can't provide you favor or care because you're not of me. I cannot give you, I cannot see you, that word cement, advice. I cannot give you advice and I cannot approve your way because you are not of me. That's deep. Our belief in Jesus gives us acceptance into his kingdom. It gives you access to his care, his favor, his advice, his approving will appear as we go the way that we should go. So we see this, but then I love this. Because Elijah, he doesn't say, okay, let's go out and fight. He says, Elijah says, let's worship. Wow. Let's worship. Let's worship the Lord. Elijah calls the worshipers to come in and to enter into the presence of God. Because in the presence of God is where you will hear the voice of God. And as the music begins to play, the scripture says that the spirit of God rests upon him and begins to speak to him. I want to remind you that in 1 Samuel 16, 23, I don't know if you remember, but King Saul was being tormented by an evil spirit and King David grabbed his harp. Okay, listen, y'all. He didn't have a band. He didn't have a keyboard. He, did, he didn't have, you know, three, six singers. He, it was just David. I want to tell you this. I'm not the best singer. You probably hear me across the room. I know that I'm not the best singer. But I just want to be in the presence of God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it sounds like. God, I just need you to move and I want to hear your voice. Now, I used to make fun of me because I used to go and sing in the shower in Bible college. And we like these little shower rooms. Like I'm telling you like this big right here. Like this. So I would be singing and singing and then I would walk out of the room and there would be this like cloud of smoke because from the, it all building up in the room. And I was like, there's her glory cloud coming out with her. And we would laugh and cut up. But sometimes when you got a, when you got a dorm floor, floor full of 35 girls and everywhere you turn there's another person. Sometimes that's the only place I could get in with God. Without somebody else in my space. Right, right. So I, I would be in the bathroom worshiping the Lord. I want to encourage you that you don't have to just worship the Lord here with a band. You can worship the Lord in your quiet space. You can worship the Lord in your valley on your mountaintop. You can worship the Lord in your car. You can worship the Lord on your job. You can worship the I mean, I'm telling you, when you tap into a heart of worship, just the Jesus I love me part and I, I and I was like whoa those words are good you can sing just start singing to the Lord and watch what happens just start making a song up towards the Lord and watch what happens as you begin to proclaim his goodness towards your life he's going to begin to show up in a way that you never experienced him before and Elisha was a man of God that called worship. We don't need to fight. We don't need to struggle. We don't need to beat Jehoshaphat over the head for messing up. We don't, we don't need to, to kick um, Jehoram out. I mean, I guess he was there while they worshipped, right? So it just let's just worship the Lord. Because we need, we need instruction. We need direction. I don't know about you, but the time that we live in is getting darker and darker. And I need some instruction. I need, I want to be led by the Spirit in every area of my life. God, what would you have me to do? And Elijah shows up and, he, and they worship the Lord. And this is the instructions that the Lord gave. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. 
Elijah begins to hear these instructions. The Holy Spirit begins to speak to his heart and light up the path that they should go. Man, I would have liked to hear like the rain's going to come and it's going to fall and God is going to show up. And no, God says dig. Mm. I was like, oh, I'm going to be tired. You're right. Right? Come on. How many times in our walk, in our journey with the Lord, you know, it's tiresome. It's weary. And he says, no, I want you. And see, we want to hear, you're coming on up out of the valley. We want to He's plant your feet on solid ground. And he has. <laughs> but so many times, he might want to keep us there because he's doing something in the valley. He didn't say, okay, come on up out. He said, dig ditches in the valley and we see these instructions and we sit we find ourselves here at times that word make to make this valley means to accomplish or advance what you're going to do in the time of the valley is going to accomplish and advance something in your heart and in your life and in your relationship with God but what do we do with the valley experience? What do we do when we're lonely, when we're scared, when we're in pain, when we're in time of need, when we're confused or frustrated? What do we do? He said to dig deep, <laughs> to dig deep in the valley. Don't you stop trusting. Don't you stop believing. Don't you stop holding on to the word of God. Don't you stop proclaiming the word of God over your life. No, I don't want to just like, you know, blab it and grab it and claim it and name it and all that good stuff. No, but I will proclaim and declare the word of God over my life and over my family's life and what God wants to do. And that's what he said. He said, dig deep in the valley. And then he says, you're not going to see the wind. You're not going to see the rain, but it will be full. I want to encourage you today. You might not see it. You might not have seen it yet in the natural. But I believe if you can't see wind, but you can feel it. You can feel it. So allow the Lord to stir your heart just a little bit more. It's coming. Whatever it is for you, it's coming. If you want family members saved, delivered, and freed, it's coming. If you've been praying for your future, it's coming. If you've been praying for something, healing, it's coming. Deliverance coming. See, there's a wind that you can feel in the spirit. You can't see it, but it's coming. Are we going to keep digging and believing and trusting? Because he was preparing his people in the valley to be full. And they found themselves here. And in this place, could you imagine digging ditches in the valley? I could only imagine, and who knows how big it was. So could you imagine digging day and night? You would have blisters on your hands. Yeah. You would be tired and dirty. You would be thirsty and hungry. You know we'd be complaining. <laughs> we would be complaining. We wouldn't be understanding. Why is God got me at this job? Mm. Why does God have me? Why was I born into this family? Mm. Come on. Why, why does nobody, why am I have no godly friends? Why am I here? Why haven't I seen that promise fulfilled? Why, why? And digging and digging and digging. But you know what? We need to be quiet. And we need to allow the Lord to do what he wants to do in our lives and keep trusting and keep believing and keep digging by faith, yeah. digging deep in the valley. Hallelujah. And I was talking to Pastor Matt about this. I thought it was pretty cool because in the word of God, it says not only is it going to be full for you, but it says it's going to be full for your cattle and for your beasts. Mm. That means that this, this digging, he, he said, usually Israel used digging ditches as an irrigation system. I thought that was pretty cool because an irrigation system was a method of delivering water to an area that needed it. You might be the very one 
to bring the water of the gospel to someone in need. In that job that you hate. <laughs> in them family outings that you hate. <laughs> in those people that you find yourself around so often. In your family. With your children. With your grandchildren. You might be the very one allowing the spirit of God to move through you. That brings water and touches many others that are beside you and that are next to you. But I mean, we've got to not quit. We've got to not give up. And the most sufficient um, irrigation system was called a dripping system. And it was meant to be applied to the roots of the plant. I thought that was really cool because God is concerned with your roots. He's concerned that when you travel through life, that we will stand. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes digging. Yeah. Digging, digging, and digging ditches in the valley. But I love this because 2 Kings 13, 18 says, And this is but a light thing. Mm -hmm. This is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also in to your hand. So we find ourselves digging and in the impossible of the impossible situation. We're believing and we're trusting and we're believing and we're trusting. And I want to encourage you today that this thing is but a light thing in the sight of God. He is the God of the impossible. Let's get it out of our Sunday school mentality when we hear he is the God of the impossible. I want to hold on to the word of God and believe no God, you are the God of the impossible. And what seems so heavy for man, so much for us to carry, we need to lay our burdens at his feet and keep digging because he said, this is but a light thing in the sight of God. That means it's small and it's easy to take care of. Amen. See, we get in a way, we get in a place of discouragement and defeat. But he wants to bring into very existence that very thing that you need today. Naya, if you would come, if you would stand with me. That thing that the enemy has been de trying to destroy the plan of God upon your life and your, and your faith in God moving in that area or that circumstance or that situation. And the enemy has come in and you find yourself in this valley and maybe we've laid down in the valley. Maybe we gave up in the valley. But I want to encourage you this morning to keep digging. 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 And keep digging. Because later on in 2 Kings 3.20, it says, Not only was the valley full, but the country was filled with water. I believe that the Lord is going to begin with the household of God. And as we keep believing and digging, the Spirit of God will move in this place. And then the country will be filled with water. It will be filled with people on revival and getting saved and set free and healed and delivered. This is what a light thing in the sight of God. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you felt discouraged, 